Initiation by Elizabeth H. Chapter 20. The Ayurvedas. I was working again every day in my studio. Once while I was working, I was suddenly overcome by an unbearable restlessness. I felt as if I was really doing nothing. Time was rushing by madly with giant strides. Days were going by, each like the one before, and I was doing nothing, nothing. How come I am doing nothing, I asked myself. I am working all day long, studying and reading a whole library of books. When I am tired, I play the piano. Why should I feel like I'm doing nothing? I thought back about the last few years, and I heard an answer within me. You've done nothing, absolutely nothing, to alleviate the suffering of others. Being a wife, a mother, a sculptress, all these things are purely personal matters. That was true. But what could I have done? For several years, I'd been waiting for higher powers to give me an order about what I should do. I had never once heard the voice. How am I to know what kind of work, work in quotes, I am to do? I asked myself. When I think back now, As I'm telling myself this, I call to mind the person I was then. I simply have to smile. How naive is the human being, the unknowing person? How could anyone be a co-worker in the great plan if he has not yet reached the goal himself, if he has not been able to conquer himself? But every person who awakens and sees the goal of life goes through the growing pains of wanting to save humanity instead of first saving himself. The higher powers actually do see to it that every neophyte is cured of this naive idea. At that time, however, I was not yet cured, and I was bent on making people happy. Ever since I'd taken my vow, I never forgot for a moment that's what I was living for. Various temptations which might have been real temptations for other people or for me early in my life, no longer presented any problems. There were men enough who wanted to satisfy their desire for pleasure. They said they loved me. I saw quite clearly, however, that they did not even notice me, the being I am in reality. They simply wanted physical love. How could that have interested me after I had looked into the nature's trap? Such desires were not even flattering for my vanity. On the contrary, I found it degrading that men again and again coveted my body. When the conversation was ranging over profound philosophical themes, the man with whom I was talking and who claimed to be a friend was enthusiastic about my intelligence, but at the first opportunity... He wanted to kiss me. Did he perhaps want to kiss my intelligence? (laughs) Another was enthusiastic about my musical ability. When I played the piano for a group of friends, he said he was a music worshiper. Kissing my hand, he looked deep into my eyes. But with what sensuality? I was already acquainted, and such music worship I was already acquainted with such music worship and laughed at him. How boring, how boring. I really was attracted by music, philosophy, and psychology. In fact, by all the kinds of arts and science. But I had to learn again and again that most philosophers, psychologists, astronomers, scientists, artists, just like other men, considered sex much more interesting. The poor boys... What will they have left when they come to the days when they lose their masculinity, emptiness, their own terrible emptiness? And these men wanted to convince me that I was wasting my life because I did not want to taste sexual pleasures at every opportunity. How debasing. Can men only see sex? Can they not simply be human beings over and above the level of sex? Like children who play together for the fun of playing, and not because the game involves sex in any way. Many people go in for music, art, theater, psychology, only in order to be able to conquer new partners, one after another, 
The Bible says, If ye are not like unto little children, verily I say unto you, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The tremendous depth of this wonderful saying became really apparent to me when I saw the unrest and dissatisfaction of the people who live only for sex. These poor, empty people, when they noticed my indifference, thought I was inhibiting my natural urges or simply pretending. I always analyzed myself very strictly, and I never had a thought which would have attracted me to a man. I loved my husband just as much as ever, but no longer as a woman loving a man, but as one human being loving another. It was no temptation, no struggle, and no victory over my desires, for I simply had no desire for a man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ever since that night, when I had clearly recognized the deceit of physical love, I had no longer felt myself to be a woman. And that night, I became a human being, a self, and the self has no desire for sex. The self is without sex. The self is not a half of something, seeking its complementary half. The self is a complete whole. And when a person recognizes this truth, the body follows. As I cogitated on these things there in my studio, I suddenly had the same feeling I'd had years before when practicing thought transmission. And when unable to pick up and carry out another's thought, I felt such a weight on my chest that I could scarcely breathe. Putting down my modeling tools, I tried to concentrate. Then, just as I felt, had felt it years before, I felt the strange prickling sensation throughout my whole body, and again I heard that well-known voice, which had been silent for so long, the blessed voice. Why are you neglecting your spiritual ab abilities? How shall I not neglect them? What can I do about them? I answered back. You know very well that merely being born with a talent for music, sculpture, and other arts does not mean by any manner of means that a person is an artist. He must develop his art, and to do that he must practice, practice, and practice some more. Talent without diligence, and diligence without talent, is not an art. But if you combine your talent with diligence, that is real art. You have talents, which you simply allow to lie at idle. The ability to express the spirit. Practice, practice, practice. And you will become an artist in the kingly art, which stands above all other art, in the artless craft. My heart began to beat fast. For years I had been waiting for an inner order as to what I should do. I had never received an answer. There was nothing else for me to do but keep on working and fulfilling the daily duties that life demanded of me. I learned psychology and sculpturing. These two studies supplemented each other wonderfully. When I was working on a bust, I developed deep into the psychology of my model. I found all people simply fascinating, and the more profoundly I was able to penetrate into their psychology, the better my heads turned out. I began to realize that a portrait and a psychological analysis are one and the same kind of work. In making a bust of a person, I had to be simultaneously giving him psychological advice, and everyone whom I've ever modeled has remained spiritually very close to me. My monumental works and large compositions were also a great source of pleasure to me. The concentration opened ever new doors to ever new vistas of truth. But in the depths of my soul, I was sorry not to be hearing the voice anymore. I was as dry as sawdust, feeling that I had lost contact with some power coming from the highest source. Now the source was re-established and the voice was telling me that I should practice the artless art. How should I practice it? Is there such a thing as an appropriate form of exercise? If there is, I never heard of it. 
Once again, very clearly, I heard the voice within me. Seek. Seek? Where and how, I asked. There was no answer. That evening, we were invited over to the home of a friend who, when I was dying, had saved my life by teaching me yoga exercises and how to guide my consciousness. We were a jolly group. The men freshened up their school day memories, and I amused myself by looking at our friend's library. One book in particular attracted me very much, and I asked whether I might take it home. Of course, said my friend. I took the book and I sat down to talk with the man. I asked our friend to tell us how and where he had learned these yoga exercises and with, with which he had healed me. <clears throat> he told me that he had once been invited by an Indian Maharaja <clears throat> to, go hunt, to go tiger hunting. During the hunt, his horse suddenly shied and threw him out of the saddle in a very unfortunate way, so that he fell on his back and was not able to get up. He was carried back to his room. The Maharaja visited him and asked him which of his two physicians he should send, the English or the Indian. Our friend asked for the English physician. The latter prescribed various sedatives and pain-killing drugs and advised him to stay in bed. Days went by, weeks went by, and he was still lying helpless, unable to get up, unable to even move his neck or back. At the end of six weeks, he was still getting worse. The Maharaja came to visit him again. You asked for the English physician, he said, and I sent him to you. He's been treating you for six weeks, but your condition has only been getting worse. I suggest you ask the advice of my Indian physician, my Ayurvedic practitioner. He could help you. Our friend asked the Maharaja to send him at once. What is Ayurvedic practitioner, I asked. It is a person who is initiated into and acquainted with the Ayurveda. Our friend replied, the Vedas, I mean Ayurveda, the Vedas are the holy books of the Indians, the highest philosophy on earth. They are made up of various parts. The Ayurveda is the science of health, contains all the secrets of the human body, diseases, methods of healing, maintenance of health. As early as five to six thousand years ago, these initiates had developed operative techniques for replacing injured organs of the body and healthy organs with healthy organs removed from corpses. They were able to perform the most unbelievable operations. They were able to replace a blind eye with a healthy one, both in animals and humans, and they were a even able to replace an entire leg. They also knew that diseases were caused by myriads of tiny invisible creatures, which today we call bacteria. They also regarded bacteria as the cells of the invisible body of a demonic spirit, whereas Western scientists, with the exception of a few initiates like Paracelsus, have never made an attempt at research in this field. The evil spirit takes possession of one or more persons that invades the person with his body, and when the person's vibrations coincide with those of the evil spirit, he becomes sick. However, there are always persons whose vibrations are different from those of the demon. These persons do not become sick. In the terms of Western science, they are immune. In the holy books of India, all these diseased spirits are thoroughly described as to their appearance and even shown in colored pictures. They are horrible figures, each with its characteristic appearance and color. The demon of the plague, for example, is a black monster and you will recall that the plague is also called the Black Death. The spirit of another equally fatal disease is a yellow demon, and the disease he causes is known as yellow fever. The spirit of leprosy has a lion-like head, and you perhaps know that lepers can be recognized from quite a distance by the lion-like appearance of their faces. 
Through the face of a leper, one can see and recognize the lion face of the spirit by which he is possessed. Pneumonia is caused by a gigantic red demon representing, represented as consisting of fire and flame, and so goes each disease as ascribed to a person's being possessed by a certain specific demon. Just a moment, I interrupted. What did you say? Pneumonia comes from a gigantic red demon? How interesting. And a childhood memory so suddenly came to light again in my eyes. Again, I saw my little brother jumping up in his bed, looking off in the distance of the room with his eyes bulging and screaming at the top of his lungs. Mother, mother, the red man is coming to get me. Mother, help. And I can see now how he waved his little hands as if trying to ward off an invisible enemy. Then he fainted, and Mother said, What he sees is nothing real. He's having an hallucination. But I saw at the time that it happened that this red man represented reality. For the child, apparently, it was an objective reality, as the Indians already knew several thousand years ago. For reality is not only what we can grasp with our hands and see with our eyes. I told him about this experience. I told him about this experience I had had as a child, but our friend was not surprised. The sick often see these demons at the moment that they become possessed by them, sometimes later too. During the sickness, <clears throat> when they are fighting with the demon, <clears throat> whenever they mention this, however, People merely say they have fever and they're seeing things. No one ever seems to consider the origin of these pictures in the imagination of the deceased, as the persons have never thought about such things, nor why persons suffering from the same disease always see the same pictures without having ever spoken to each other or even having met or known each other. When our friend went on with his story about the Maharaja's Ayurvedic physician, he was a rather young Indian, friendly and well-bred, who later became a close friend with whom he was still corresponding. After investigating his nervous reflections, the young Indian physician went away and brought back pills, ordering him to take three a day. On parting, the young Indian doctor smiled and said, in three days, you'll be writing again. Our friend sighed in disbelief. The next morning, he was able to move his head. Then the Indian physician came again, gave him some more pills, and had him do a few breathing exercises combined with guidance of consciousness. The next afternoon, he was able to sit up, and he felt a prickling sensation in his spinal column, as if new vital force were flowing into it. On the second day, he was able to get up and he walked a few steps into the room. He ate his lunch with a ravenous appetite and later went down to the garden. On the third day, he was wa waking up fresh and full of pep. He went out for a ride. As the friendship between the two men grew, he once asked the Indian physician what he had given him to heal him so miraculously. Our science is handed down from father to son, said the Indian. When a son is initiated into this science, he must first make a solemn vow that he will never, under any circumstances, betray these secrets. No one has ever yet broken this oath. I cannot tell you the secret of these pills, but I can tell you a few things about our science. The pills I gave you represent a chemical compound consisting mainly of gold. This gold compound, however, is not merely so much inert matter. On the contrary, we might even call it living gold. In its preparation, it was kept at a constant moderate temperature in a hermetically sealed crucible for several weeks. Through this process, special properties connected with life are developed in the gold. You know that if you keep an egg at a constant temperature of 104 degrees for 21 days, it will hatch. 
a living chick. On the other hand, if you subject the egg to a temperature of 212 degrees for 10 minutes, the egg will harden but will never become a chicken. That's exactly what happens with this gold preparation. The constant temperature over several weeks' time develop, develops in the gold a form of energy with the same vibrations as our vital energy. This energy stands far above atomic energy. It has taken millions of years for gold to develop from ordinary coarse matter of the earth through an exceedingly slow process. If we develop this process further, we can transform the gold into another material charged with the very highest form of energy. Just as one can magnetize a piece of ordinary iron, we can also develop ordinary gold into magnetic or living gold, living gold in quotes. The magnetism of the gold, however, represents a much higher energy than the magnetism found in iron. It has the same vibrations as our own vital energy. In fact, it is life itself and has a miraculous effect on all living creatures. Man may be likened to a living magnet charged with this very highest form of energy. Just as a magnet loses its charge over time, but can be remagnetized by passing an electric current around it, in the same way human beings can be recharged with this energy. The seed of this vital energy is the marrow and the spinal column. If your fall from the horse, this very delicate, no, in your fall from the horse, this very delicate organ was injured and the tension of your vital energy fell abruptly. Your organism was unable to recover because the healing centers themselves were injured. These pills recharged your nerve centers. Natural processes were set in motion and now you are well. That's all there is to it. See what these pills do for the Maharaja? In spite of his very advanced age, he wants to keep on demonstrating his many powers every day with his favorite wife. With the help of these gold pills, he still retains the powers of a young man. Unaided nature is no longer able to supply his body with this energy, but this preparation sets his nerve centers in motion, and that is sufficient to recharge his sexual organs daily. Our friend asked the Indian physician, Why do you keep your knowledge so secret? Why can't all humanity enjoy the blessing of your science? Why don't you teach it to the English doctors who are here? For a while, the Indian physician looked off into the distance, and then he said, Just as an egg needs to be fertilized for the life within it to be charged from a latent state into an active state, in the same way, the preparation of this gold compounds requires a source of power to transform certain latent forces within the gold molecules into active ones, thus changing the inert gold into an active vital material. This source of power is a human being himself. The power of reproduction cannot only be manifested by the body but also on another plane as energy. A hypnotist, for example, manifests his power of reproduction on a spiritual plane and can penetrate the mind of another person, causing certain forces to change from a latent state to an active state, just as a sperm cell from his body is able to unite with an ovum to set in motion a process of life within the latter. In order to set in motion a certain process in various materials, in this case gold, a person needs the radiation of his own vital energy. However, if he expends his energy through his sexual organs, he automatically puts into latent state the very nerve centers he needs to radiate vital energy in the original basic form. These nerves open and close automatically. A person can either channel this energy into sexual organs or 
into other higher nerve centers, but he cannot simultaneously channel it to both. You can easily understand that when a father initiates his son into the science, the son, along with his oath of silence, must take a vow of complete continence. That's why the son can only be initiated when he is already married and has several sons of his own, in order that there be no interruption in the chain of knowledge. But just show me a Western physician who would be willing to live a life of complete continence for the sake of this knowledge. On the contrary, it has been our experience that the majority of your physicians want to use this knowledge to earn as much money as possible in order to be able to satisfy their animal instincts to the maximum extent. Many Western physicians have visited us and tried all sorts of persuasion to get us to part with our secrets. We saw that these secrets, they merely wanted to earn piles of money, satisfy their vanity, or become fam famous. It is a sad fact that the foreign power in this country even went to the extent of torturing several of our Ayurvedic physicians in a fruitless effort to get them to reveal their secrets. Ever since then, foreigners in India do not meet any Ayurvedic physicians simply because none of the latter will admit that he is one or that he possesses any special knowledge. We were forced to wear masks and become mysterious Orientals. We had to pay a high price to learn this lesson. Nevertheless, I can tell you this much. All through the years, there have been foreign physicians who, for high-minded, truly humanitarian reasons, sought to acquire our knowledge and were willing to take the oath of Brahmahara, continence, in brackets, continence. Um, these doctors have received initiation and are working with us. On the other hand, they keep their knowledge just as secret as we do. When humanity has progressed to such an extent that the majority of doctors are willing to forego their sexual lusts in order to be able to heal, Indian Ayurvedic physicians will be willing to reveal the secret knowledge to them. At present, however, people in the West use all their inventions to harm each other. Take dynamite, for instance, and aeroplanes. What have they done with these things? Made them into new weapons. What would they do if they knew the secret of cosmic energy and of still higher vital energy? They'd merely figure out new ways to kill each other off and earn still more money. War is business. And what's this business for? Why do people run after more and more money? In order to indulge their sexual pleasures, lusts, and perversities to a greater extent. You ask why we do not reveal our secrets. The answer is that foreign doctors really do not want them. When they hear that they have to give up their lusts in order to acquire this knowledge, they lose interest right away. They simply cannot believe that by paying such a cheap price, they could learn the secret of all life. It's much easier for them not to bother to make a single attempt but merely to poke ridicule at Orientals. Most of the foreigners who come to our country think that the highest happiness on earth is the satisfaction of their sexual desire. How could they ever know anything about the tremendous power that a spiritual person possesses if they never make an attempt themselves to attain it? This power cannot be acquired through either money or might. The price is renunciation. But people who have paid this price have quickly discovered that they really did not want to give up anything. They find, on the contrary, that they have discovered immortal happiness in the place of mortal, a permanent state of pleasure instead of a transitory one. No one can make a better bargain, but we do not discuss these things. These secrets cannot be understood with the intellect alone. Spirit cannot be understood. It can only be experienced. One can only be spirit. 
We are content to let others travel the path of the intellect. They have already accomplished much and they will accomplish more. But the highest truth will always remain hidden for the person who merely follows his intellect and never learns the bliss of pure being to which the path of renunciation leads. People in the West have made the Oriental Yogi a cosmic book character. No. People in the West have made the Oriental Yogi a comic book character. Is it any wonder that the initiates, who do not reveal their secrets, but merely withdraw and remain unreachable for Western people? I have told you all this because I can see that you're not interested in our sciences purely out of curiosity, but rather because of deep spiritual desire. You seek the truth. You seek God. We are ready and glad to help such people. I'll give you a bit of advice. If you want to make faster progress and plunge deeper, deeper into the secrets of human life, practice yoga. The Indian doctor went on to explain that for many thousands of years, the Orientals have been discovering and perfecting various methods by which people can reach the goal of happiness, a goal everyone carries in his heart, regardless of how ignorant he may be or how low his individual state of consciousness. Right here on earth, people can reach this fulfillment, this salvation, this state of eternal bliss, or as Orientals call it, nirvana. The door is open for every person when he finds the key. The key is yoga. Our friends, Indian doctor, went on to explain that every human act or activity which is done with concentration is actually yoga as the only way we have of reaching a greater goal is through concentration. In studying yoga systematically, however, we learn techniques for developing and improving our powers of concentration. And these are methods which have been per perfected through thousands of years. There are various paths in yoga, physical, mental, and spiritual exercises in concentration. These exercises develop the highest abilities of the human being, opening up his spiritual eyes, his spiritual ears, and teaching him to be master of himself, master of creative forces, master of the forces of fate. The pathway to happiness is opened up, or to express it another way, the pathway to self-realization, to God. The highest and at the same time the most difficult yoga path is that of Raja Yoga. Raja means king. If we translate this term literally, we find that this yoga path is known as the regal yoga or majestic yoga. It is the shortest path, but at the same time the steepest and bumpiest. It is the pathway Jesus taught in the Bible. With patience and perseverance, however, one reaches the goal. My husband's schoolboy friend went on with the story. The Indian physician showed me the basic exercises of yoga, the ones I showed you. But later, he told me how to get in touch with one of the greatest living yogis. I went to him. He was a man over 80 years old, but he did not look to be over 40. He was a Hatha yogi. These yogis know all the secrets of the body. They are able to maintain their bodies in constant and perfect health for several hundred years if they want to. The Indians claim that in the mountains there are yogis living today who are 700 and 800 years old. My husband began to laugh. Now, now I'll tell one. 700 years old? Not bad at all. But at that point, you woke up, right? See, our friend answered quite seriously. You are a true Occidental. Just because there are some things you haven't heard about, this doesn't mean by any matter of means that they don't exist. The Orientals know much more about the science of man than we in the West. 
but they have learned to keep it quiet. From time to time, the first Occidentals arrived from the Orient, and they have done all kinds of things that they have made the Orientals keep silent. Even today, they can still keep their secrets. I saw things in India that taught me to be very cautious about laughing other people out of court. Okay, okay, my husband answered. I believe too that there must be some way of living longer when we think that even here in the West, the human lifespan is constantly being lengthened in spite of all we do to shorten it with nicotine, alcohol, and wrong living habits. 50 or 60 years ago, the average lifespan was 35 years, whereas now it's around 60. Makes one wonder what the limit really is. Medical science is progressing with giant strides. Who knows how far we'll go? See, your real conviction is not cynical at all. But here in the West, we don't dare to admit that we believe just because it isn't even considered the thing to do. To talk about things that we don't understand, we always try to affect a superior, cynical manner. I have great respect for what our scientists know, but they act as if they knew the secrets of life, whereas they are completely ignorant about death. The Orientals have discovered the secret of life and death, but their one and only weapon against the cynicism of the West is silence. No wonder. Here's an example. An Indian showed me a cigarette lighter. It was a little figure of a Buddha sitting in the so-called lotus position, a cheap lighter such as one would get at any bazaar. And he told me, an Oriental would never use the figure of Christ for a cigarette lighter because we feel respect for the sacred symbols of other religions, just as for our own. We know that one and the same God stands above and behind all the various sacred symbols. So saying, he gently put down the Buddha cigarette lighter on his household altar. As a Westerner, I felt deeply ashamed, and I often wonder when we in the West will wake up and have enough sense not to go on constantly insulting Orientals by such offenses against tact, respect, and good taste. Just think, too, about all our Western films that deal with the Orient. Orientals see these films, too, and I'm sure you can guess what they think about them but they are silent. I asked our friend, are there books about yoga? The most beautiful and the most sacred book of the Indians is the Bhagavata Gita. Bhagavad Gita. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, in it, you can read the most beautiful description of the spiritual path to self-development through Raja Yoga. That's what I rec would recommend to you. I had heard enough. <clears throat> that very evening, I wanted to begin reading the book our friend had loaned me. I lay down comfortably in bed and took the book and opened it. To my great surprise, I saw that in, it was not the book I had chosen. I turned it around and I looked at the title on the back. How strange. I had read the title while browsing through our friend's library and now remembered distinctly that I had taken out the book I wanted. Could I have made a mistake? Could I have pulled out the book next to it? Apparently. But now that I had this book, I wanted to at least look at it. I immediately awakened. It immediately awakened my interest. On the outside, it looked like a modern book but inside it contained a very, very old manuscript. The paper was yellow and brown with age, full of traces of worms. Both the dark black ink as well as the writing showed that the book was very old indeed. The more I read, the more surprised and excited I became, until, I finally, to, until finally my hands fairly trembled with the enforced suspense is that I devoured page after page. The manuscript told 
but a secret spiritual order that was as old as the earth itself. Without any external visible form of membership, the order was constantly taking in neophytes who came in contact with it without actually knowing anything about it. This coming into contact occurred when a person reached a state of development that he completely gave up his own person and dedicated his entire life to alleviating the suffering of others. Whenever a person has reached this decision, <coughs> excuse me, a member of the secret order gets in spiritual touch with him, or rather, the individual who has decided to give up his person and thus has reached universal love has reached a stage in his development such that he automatically responds to the vibrations flowing among the members of this secret spiritual fraternity. At first, he hears within himself the voice of the spiritual leader and guide, warning him about the difficulties, dangers, and consequences of his decision. If he sticks to his decision, this order, will, which exists to help humanity climb out of chaos, accepts him as a member. At first, he's on probation without actually knowing it. This probationary period begins immediately, and for seven long years, the neophyte is left completely on his own. During this time, he has no contact with the order, no matter how much he may desire or seek it. But the various tests he must pass, one after another, seven of them relate to the human virtues, becoming free of sensuality, vanity, anger, covetousness, 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 envy, sensitivity, and then on the other side, the ability to withstand outside influences. If he passes all these tests, in spite of being entirely on his own, and if he sticks by his decision, he is considered ready to begin his work and is definitely accepted within the order. On the very same day, he learns about his acceptance through an apparent coincidence. From then on, he receives thorough training and simultaneously specific tasks. At first, these tasks are easy, and as he performs them satisfactorily, they become progressively more difficult. The tasks are very difficult. Some neophytes must work in public, others behind the scenes. Some roam the countryside as beggars, others very rich. In either case, they must fulfill their duties. Some work as assistants of famous discoveries, others as writers or lecturers. Some hold positions of great worldly power, while others may hold down jobs as workmen in huge factories. It can even happen that two members of the order appear to be working against each other. Such persons are not permitted to reveal in any way at all that they belong together and that they are in contact with each other. Sometimes they are celebrated and enjoy tremendous popularity. At other times they may live in abject misery and be subjected to privations and degradations. They must fulfill all their tasks in a completely free and impersonal manner, simply as servants within the great plan. And as they perform their tasks, they must bear full responsibility for their each and every act. They receive their assignments, but they must figure out themselves how to carry them out in complete awareness of the responsibility they bear for everything they do. The higher they rise, the greater their responsibility. Anyone who refuses to bear the responsibility for his acts and his work and tries to unload the responsibility on another member of the order, anyone who does not recognize his work as his own personally chosen task, but tries to make it appear as if he's acting on the instructions of the order or as a spiritual tool of a member of the order, such a person is a traitor and instantly loses all contact with the order. He does not know, however, that he has lost contact and it's possible for him 
to go on for years believing himself to be a co-worker within the order. Such persons are used by the order to test other people to find out whether they accept and follow these false prophets or whether they have progressed far enough in thinking independently and reaching their own decisions so that they weigh every word they hear and only accept it after it is past examination. Those who follow false prophets are still blind, allowing themselves to be led by blind, and both fall by the wayside. Membership of the order is restricted to persons who are completely self-reliant and able to resist influence. They must not be people who do good or avoid doing evil merely out of a spirit of obedience or because they expect to be rewarded for it and go to heaven or because they fear punishment and want to avoid going to hell. On the contrary, the order's members must be persons who always, in life and death, follow their own deepest conviction and act accordingly. This is because the members hear the order's messages in their own hearts as their own profoundest convictions. I read these lines with ever-mounting excitement. Renounce earthly pleasures? How I remember the night when I sobbed so desperately in bed. Can one renounce them any more definitely than I did then? Sincere and deep desire to alleviate the sufferings of others? God alone knows how earnest was the vow I took that time in my room, thinking intently about the terrible sufferings of the mentally ill and the incessant and unremitting pains and the troubles of people all over the world. Now I remember the warnings so I clearly the warnings I so clearly heard then and the awesome feeling of being alone, the desperate feelings of being completely abandoned for so many years. How many years since that time? Seven years? Yes, exactly seven. And today, this curious coincidence with the book? Coincidence? No. It was a message. A message. I was shaken to the depths of my being by this experience. As was my custom, I examined the whole matter again with my mind and intellect. For I never stopped using my intellect as a means of testing and checking. But what could my intellect say now? I knew best that all this was so. What else could my intellect do but simply recognize the facts? Even the most skeptical intellect would be silenced in the face of so many coincidences. No, I could not doubt it. I had been accepted. I was overcome by a feeling of inexpressible happiness and gratitude. I felt the grace of God, his blessing, deep humility, and a profound sense of awe. In this condition, I have remained ever since.